Welcome everybody. Uh, my name is Rodney Allen. Uh, my company is Rodney Allen and Associates. Uh, I own and operate a global occupational health security consulting firm headquartered out of Palmetto, Florida. And today the topic that I'm going to be talking about and that I'm very excited about is called a competent strategic thinking thinker is a valuable and rare skill. That is very, very, very important in this day and age. And I think more, the more people know about it, then the more people, the better off people will be. Uh, we have a very special guest today, uh, Mr. Andy Fox, uh, the owner of Fox Business Group, LLC, which is a marketing company that's been around for years, and, and that is a, uh, a pillar and a, uh, a, a a stronghold in the, in the in Manatee County and Bradenton, Sarasota, Lakewood Ranch area in particular. Andy, uh, you want to introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about yourself? Well, I've been in business for over 30 years. We do advertising, marketing, training, and consulting, and we pride ourselves in working with people with their business plans and marketing plans and try to achieve the most for their business. So they can be successful. Now, Andy, uh, because he's a he's a wise sage of business here in Manatee County, uh, he's going to be asking pointed questions of me, so that uh, uh, not only the information that I'm going to be putting out is going to be valuable, but those questions and those answers are going to even increase the value of this uh, seminar or this uh, YouTube video even more. So uh, let's start out with. Uh, the first thing I want people to realize about being a competent strategic thinker is that you got to have two qualities, and, and I want you to keep these two qualities in the back of your mind. Number one, you got to have the curiosity of an eight-year-old, and number two, you got to love to learn. If you got those two qualities, then you are well on your way to be a competent strategic thinker. And that is important. Uh, Andy, you got any questions? Uh, you Not got any yet. questions about why uh, those two qualities are important? Not yet. Okay. I'm going to go through my PowerPoint presentation. Um, the first person I'm going to talk about four people, and they all have PhDs, which means uh, they're, they've been through uh, vetted and they've been through a very rigorous process. And these four people, I did a Google search of the 20 most influential people in the world in terms of strategic thinking and planning. Uh, and the, I came up and I distilled it down to these four people, these four names. And I want you to remember these names because after you look at this YouTube uh, video and you want to go ahead and do some further research, some deeper research, some wider research, or get a better understanding of what strategic, comp, being a competent strategic thinker is, then you're gonna wanna go back to the source, to these four people. And then uh, I think that you will be well pleased with your progress. <clears throat> the first person I wanna talk about is Dr. Henry Mitzberg. Uh, Dr. Henry Mitzberg is internationally renowned academic and author of business management and he's been researching that area for over 40 years. That's important. Uh, he's currently uh, teaching at a school in Canada called McGill University. And uh, so that, he's a very interesting individual. I like him a lot. I learned a lot from him. Uh, the second person that I want to talk about is Dr. Richard A. Lomet. He's a president and founding member of Strategic Management Society and author on strategic management. And he has over 40 years of research experience in that area. Uh, the third person that I want to talk about is, Mr. is Dr. Clayton Christensen. He's the world's top management thinker and author of personal philosophy. And he has over 40 years of experience in that uh, research in that area. And finally, the, the third person, uh, she's, not, she's, she's not least and she's not last, her name is Dr. Carol S. DeWick. And she is an expert, she has a PhD 
and she is an expert in success and motivation. And she's currently teaching out of Stanford University in California. So those four people are the, uh, the crux or the, uh, the foundation of uh, my presentation in terms of developing, becoming a competent strategic thinker. And I'm gonna, uh, throughout this presentation, I'm gonna throw in some more doctors and PhDs who are critical in terms of you developing that critical skill of uh, uh, strategic thinking, competent strategic thinking. Um, there's eight secrets of great communication. First of all, you gotta be able to speak to groups as individuals, that's important. You gotta talk so people will listen. You gotta listen so people will talk. You gotta connect emotionally, you all right Andy? Mm -hmm. you, gotta you gotta have ready body language and you gotta prepare your intent and you gotta skip the jargon and you gotta practice active listening. Now, this is important. To be a competent strategic thinker, all the competent strategic thinkers that I know, and I'm gonna list them for you, they have what we call a, a coach or a business coach. Uh, if you get a person who is a personal trainer, uh, a personal trainer has a personal trainer. A registered dietitian has a registered dietitian. A certified nutritionist has a certified nutritionist. Uh, a pastor has another pastor. I mean, if you look at it, it, I mean, if you think about it, it says, how can you hear the word of, uh, of the Bible without a pastor? So a pastor, so my point is that you as an individual has to have what we call a business coach or mentor or somebody that you can bounce ideas off or get clarification on your thinking, or, or get your focus straight, or whatever. And I'm gonna, list, I'm gonna list one, two, three, four people who are considered great leaders that most people agree are great leaders. The first person I'm gonna mention is Steve Jobs of Apple. All these people had coaches or mentors. That's key, remember that. I want, I, I want you to go back to that. Uh, Alan Moulet of Ford, Eric Smith of Google, and Jack Welch of General Electric. Those are my four models of great leaders. And anybody that wants to argue with that, they can argue with it, but I tell you right now, hands down, those people are the best in the world. And I agree with them. There's six steps to clear communication. You got to identify the desired outcome. You got to choose the best mode of communication. You got to consider your tone. You got to identify potential barriers. You got to check for understanding. And then you got to ask for feedback. The six steps of communication, there's barriers to uh, when you're doing communication. For example, number one, you have biases. Number two, you have cultural differences. Number three, you have, you have accents and regional language variation. Then you have existing relationships. You have assumptions on both sides. You have defensiveness. You have stress. You have disoriented perception. You have past interaction self-esteem, environmental distractions, timing of the conversation, and information overload. Those are just some of the areas that you have to be concerned with when you're communicating. Uh, communicating, communication, good communication is a very highly sought after skill. No matter how well you communicate, there's always room for improvement where you can get better in terms of your communication. And that's one thing that I, I, I stress, uh, my background is in the United States Navy, and one of the things that they teach you in the Navy is how to use your communication skills. 
I mean, you have, if you've ever been in a situation where a classroom, a kindergarten, or a daycare, and, and what are the teachers, let's say a lot to the young, your youngsters? Use your words. Use your words. Use your communication skills. I mean, it goes back and they drill it and they drill it, and that's true. And the Navy, any problem or situation you got, the Navy teaches you how to use your communication skills, how to use your words to solve that problem, no matter what it is, no matter what circumstance and conditions. And that's the kind of training that I got from the Navy. Okay. Different communication and personality styles. If you've ever felt disconnect with your coworkers, maybe you're not speaking each other's language. Different personalities have different ways of communicating. And by a better understanding of yourself and others, you can become an effective team. Uh, this is in a book by, by a guy by the name of uh, Jeremy Kubik, Kubik, Kubisek. He's a co-author of Five Voices, How to Communicate Effectively with Everyone You Lead. You might want to go to the bookstore or go to Amazon or whatever and pick that up. You know, a little light read late at night or whatever. It won't hurt you. It'll help you. How to recognize and control emotions and communications. Recognizing and managing emotions. Our page on emotional intelligence. This is key. Emotional intelligence. I got a lot to say about emotional intelligence. Explains why it is important to understand your emotions and those of others. This page helps you recognize and understand your own emotions and explains why they are sometimes so strong. It offers some practical ideas about how you can manage your own emotions so that you can use and harness them without not governed entirely by them. Now, Emotional Intelligence, it's a book out there called Emotional Intelligence 2.0 by a guy by the name of Dr. He, he co-authored it, but he's the main guy. His name is Dr. Travis Bradbury. And Travis Bradbury has said that an indicator of your success factor is based on your emotional intelligence. Your emotional intelligence is more important than experience. It's more important than IQ. It's more important than personality. It's more important than education. That is the single most indicator of your, your ability to be successful is your emotional intelligence. I will tell you right now, to go to Amazon, Books A Million, Barnes Noble, or whoever, and get a copy of that, and don't walk, but run and get it, and read it, and digest it, and dissect it, and become a master of it, mm -hmm. because once you control, understand, you control your emotions, then you are a powerful being that cannot be stopped under any conditions or circumstances. I make that bold statement, and I stand by it. Okay, what are emotions? Okay, how to recognize, how to recognize and control emotions and communications. What are emotions? Emotions are feelings. To start to understand your emotions, you need to ask yourself two questions. How do I feel? How do I know? But others have also emotions. At the same time as being aware of your own feelings, you also need to be aware of those of others. You also need to ask, how do others feel and how do I know? There are several ways that you can tell how others are feeling, but particularly by observing what they say and how they behave, including their body language. Research suggests that more than 80% of communication is nonverbal, meaning that it comes from body language and facial expression. Many of us don't like to talk about our emotions, especially not if they really matter to us. So they tend to be expressed even more in our body language. Now I'm going to, um, Andy, have you ever heard of uh, Dr. Uh, Brene Brown? No, I haven't. Okay, Dr. Brene Brown is the world foremost authority 
on vulnerability and shame. Oh, really? Uh, do you know what vulnerability and shame mean, Andy? What I mean by that? No, explain what you mean by that. <sighs> vulnerability is uh, it's a kind of two-edged sword. And in other words, if I want to experience love, joy, happiness, then I have to go out, I have to put my emotions and my feelings and everything out on the limb, and I have to go out on the limb and expose myself. But in that, in that moment of exposing myself, I risk getting hurt. So I have to make a decision. Is it worth me risk getting hurt in order to experience the emotions of joy, love, happiness, and delight, and all those things. Once you make that decision that it is worth it, then you have made a big move, and you move to a higher level, a deeper level. Uh, shame, you have to put yourself in a position where you may do something or say something that may be awkward, unnatural, you don't feel comfortable, you're out of your comfort zone, you feel like an idiot, you feel silly, you feel whatever. But you do it because the reward is greater than the punishment or the, uh, or the, or the negative. So you have to take a risk. That risk doesn't have to be uncalculated, it can be calculated, which I, I recommend calculated risk. I'm not a gambler. Whatever I, risk I take, they're calculated. And usually, and when I calculate, I calculate the win. Uh, so it's not real, it's a risk, but at the same time, it's, it's very well thought out. So that's what I do. The power of asking questions. This is very key. Number one, I told you back, uh, back in the beginning, you gotta keep two things in mind. You gotta have, number one, the curiosity of an eight-year-old. Uh -huh. And then you gotta have, you gotta love to learn those two things? Well, let's focus on curiosity. When I was five years old, I read a book called Curious George Goes to School, Curious George Goes to the Museum. Now this monkey went, it, went all the way around, he got into trouble, he got in all kind of mischief, he, whatever, and uh, that book fired up my imagination, my curiosity to ask questions. There are other books out there, such as Dr. Seuss, um, the Dr. Seuss series. Uh, there's, um, there's other books, such as uh, The Little Engine That Could and all that kind of stuff, whatever. But my point is, at some point, you have to follow up your curiosity about life, about things in general, about activities and processes and procedures or whatever. So what that means is you have to ask questions. But the thing about asking questions in today's society, if you ask questions and they seem so simple and so obvious, people can get the wrong impression about you. They can get the impression that you are slow, you're stupid, or you, you don't understand things, or, or you, you just don't get it, or you don't pick up. All these things get in the way of you achieving your actual, becoming self-actualized and achieving your highest potential. So I, as a person, do not care about what people think. At the end of the day, I'm, I'm concerned with getting results. And I get eye-popping results. Uh, that's why I ask questions. So that I can get a, a, a deeper and greater understanding. For example, I'm in business development and sales. In order for me to satisfy the customer better than anybody else in the world, I got to do two things. I got to either understand the customer as well as the customer does, or even better than the customer does. And I, I use an example. Steve Jobs with the iPhone. He understood the customer, what the customer wanted before the customer wanted it. And he gave it to him. And the customer, they jumped right on it. I, you, you get into marketing or you get into sales or whatever, and there's two different philosophies. For example, if I'm gonna build a stadium, a football stadium that's gonna hold 100,000 people, there's a philosophy is, first you get the people, then you build a stadium, or you build a stadium and then the people will come. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm of the school, I build a stadium and the people will come. Based on, but that's based on 
my market research, my due diligence, and everything else that uh, I can bring to bear on, uh, in, in getting a good understanding of who my customer is and exactly what my customer wants. I go beyond my customer needs. I go to the point that my customer wants to be associated with me long term, not because they need me, because they want to be in my presence. That's the mentality that I have. And you can have that too. I can tell you a few books you can read to get that way, but that's another day, another story, unless you, you, know, you really want to know. Understand this about curiosity. You can learn something from everyone if you're curious enough. Have you ever had a conversation with someone who only responded in two or three word sentences and you walked away feeling like you learned very little? The person might not have been intentionally giving you short answers. Perhaps you could phrase your questions better. A lot of people fail to understand the power of asking quality questions. One effective tip for asking stronger questions is to frame questions in a positive tone, i.e., ask, how can I help with that, instead of, what do I have to do? Framing things positively assures the direction of the conversations and leaves others with a pleasant memory of the exchange. It's not only about understanding your customer as well as the customer does, but also exceeding your understanding of the customer beyond what the customer does so you can give the customer whatever the customer is. For example, if I look at you and I see that you kinda, your energy level is kind of flagging, then I'm not going to ask you, do you need a bottle of water? I'm just going to present a bottle of water or a Pepsi or some, some kind of beverage in front of you. You will naturally gravitate toward that bottle of water and take a sip. That means that I anticipated, I expected what you were going to do ahead of time. That's where you want to be. Those are the kind of customers you want. You want a customer that wants to be associated with you long term. You don't want a customer based on need. You want to go beyond that. And that's what I do. Okay. And another thing I want to talk about is mindset. The human mind was designed by the creator to be slightly negative. And the reason, this is all science. I don't talk about nothing but science and art that's been proven, that's been tested. The reason the human mind is slightly negative because as a survival tool, you either have to fight or fight. And that's why the human mind is naturally slightly negative. And you have to be aware of that. Curiosity is the key. It's the key. A few, a few years ago, Tony Jarrett participated on a panel about success with Zig Ziglar and Dennis Waitley. These are sales uh, motivators, motivation speakers. This panel of very well known motivational speakers were interviewed in Zig Ziglar's studio by Gerhard Gerwassener, another well known motivational speaker. He, he may be well known to you, but uh, I, he, he wasn't well known to me, especially with that long name. And at one point during the interview, Tony reversed the question to the interviewer. Tony asked, What do you think is the key to success? Gerhard surprised me with his response, which was curiosity. He suggested that curiosity allows a person to ask questions, learn, and truly grow. You can learn from everyone. Being curious and asking questions can help you learn things you can use to create results faster. There are three levels of listening. Now this is uh, listening, to be honest with you, listening is a, is a lost art. I, I, probably, I probably can't even count on one hand the number of people who have perfected this art of listening, except myself, because I work very hard at it and I have perfected it. I'll be honest with you, and I'm going to explain it to you. Have you ever talked with someone who was present with you that it unnerved you? If you have, then you have been in the presence of a skilled listener. Andy, are you a skilled listener? Yes, I am. 
You sure? Yeah. What did I just say? Listening to be able to understand what the person's talking about. That's what I just said? Mm-hmm. If I play the tape back, it would say that, right? It should. You're, you're confident that it would say that. Is your name Andy Fox? Yeah. I'm, I assure you that your name is Andy Fox. Well, well sure. If I bet you $1,000 that I can prove your name's not Andy Fox, would you take on that bet? No. Why not? Are you sure, are you sure you're Andy Fox? I, I'm sure. Okay. I'm okay, okay. I'm just... Just not with fun, Andy. That's all. I was just joking. You know, a little, a little levity here. Okay, have you ever talked with... Okay, we went to that. Listening... Listen to this. Listening is a skill that seems much easier to do than it actually is. Most people think that they are good listeners, but few of us really are. Not surprisingly, the skill of listening is essential to good leadership... Leaders who do not listen well don't lead well. But what is it to listen well? How do you do it? In my coaching, I found it helpful to divide listening into three different categories and have leaders focus on developing each of the skill onto itself. These are the three levels of listening. Listening level one. I also call this listening to me. Listening, level one, listening involves simply noticing everything that's going on inside you during the conversation. Do you understand, Andy? Right. You got to notice everything that's going on inside of you. That's a lesson number, that's level one. Now, level number two, I also call this listening to you. Listening level two, level two listening involves focusing your full attention 100% on the other person. Now, how do you do that, Andy? How do you focus your full attention 100% on the other person? Give me some examples. How do you do that? You're a good listener, right? You told me that. I'm a good listener. Well, how do you focus your, your attention 100% on the other person? How do you, what do you do? I sort of listen carefully and perceive certain uh, words that they're saying and the meanings that they're coming about with and being able to relate to it. Let me, let, me, let, me, uh, let, me, let me help you here, Andy. Let me put some out there for you. For example, have you ever seen somebody uh, sit down and talk? Let's, let's see you and I sit down and talk. And uh, I don't have it on here because I potentially left my phone in the car for a reason. I do that. And I got my phone sitting here, and all of a sudden my phone rings. I have a choice. I can let it ring, go to voicemail, or I can answer it. That's now, right. Okay. Now, I'm going to tell you something. This is very key, Andy. For me to listen to you 100%, I've got to remove that phone from my presence altogether. I cannot have no distractions. I cannot have no, no noise. I must focus on you. If this is causing me to, to, to lose my focus and concentration on you, I have to remove it. If doing this is causing me to lose my focus. I have to remove it. And all I have to do is just have myself and just listen. No distractions. Now you got 100% of me. There's no tapping. There's no, there's no phone. There's no, uh, there's no side conversations. There's no, it's just me and you. That's it. You, you get that, Andy? Good. Okay, good. Now, that's very important. That's an important point. So that's why I leave my, car, my phone in the car. I leave, if I have a magazine or I have a newspaper, I don't do any of that stuff. Or if somebody's trying to talk to me, I don't do any of that stuff. Okay, now listening level three, I also call this listening to us. Level three listening is the practice of no, noticing what's happening in the space between you and the person or group you're talking with. Once you know the three levels incorporated into your life is simply a matter of practice. Uh, so somebody did some research and they said, well, if you practice a particular skill for 30 days, it becomes a habit. Do you agree with that, Andy? Yeah, who said that, though? I don't remember exactly who said it. You know, but 
If I did some research and I Googled it, we could find it. If you Google it, anything in the world you want to know, just Google it. Yeah. That's the solution. Google. Everybody says Google. Google. That's it, man. So I'm going to say this to you also. When you're listening, the average person or most people, when they're listening to somebody, like say, Andy, you're talking to me. I'm listening to you, right? You know, you know what's going on in most people's head? What? They're thinking about what they're going to say to you. Mm-hmm. How they're going to rebut, rebut you. Mm-hmm. And you know what I say to that? Let it go. Forget it. Don't interrupt the person. Let the person talk. Don't think about what you're going to say. Just listen. Just let them talk. Don't say, well, I think you're wrong. Don't say that. Just listen. Listen. And I guarantee you, you will be a totally different person than if you butted in or interrupted them. You will be much further along. I guarantee you that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. 100%. I'm 100% sure because that's what I do. Mm-hmm. Um, the parts, the parts and, and facts and stories they play in failed communication. The science of storytelling. This is very important, the science of storytelling. Why telling a story is the most powerful way to activate our brain. For over 27,000 years since the first cave paintings were discovered, telling stories has been one of our most fundamental communication methods. Our brains become more active when we tell stories. A story can put your whole brain to work. By simply telling a story, you could plant ideas, thoughts, and emotions into the listeners' brains. Evolution has wired our brains to be, for storytelling. A story, if broken down into its simplest form, is a combination of cause and effect. When we hear a story, we want to relate it to one of our existing experiences. Everything in our brain is looking for the cause and effect relationships of something we've previously experienced. A story is the only way to activate parts of the brain so the listener turns the story into their own idea and experience. I'm going to summarize everything. Six steps of effective communication. Effective communication is more than just the exchange of information from sender to receiver. Communication is a complex two-way process. Thoughts and feelings need to be clearly articulated and shared for mutual understanding to be achieved. It seems simple, speak, be heard, and be understood. But ensuring that understanding is achieved is actually an art. There are six steps to achieving productive and meaningful communication every time. Number one, identify the desired icon. Number two, choose the best mode of communication. Number three, consider your tone. Number four, identify potential barriers. Number five, check for understanding. And number six, ask for feedback. Mm-hmm. Very important. Now, Andy, do you have any, any specific questions? Not really. What did you get out of this uh, presentation? I got out of the importance of communication and how to communicate effectively. Okay. And one of the problems people have today is communication and effectively. I think part of the problem is with the use of electronic media, such as um, phone, cell phones. Okay and other types of things, Mm -hmm. we're losing a lot of that flavor. Okay. And I think what the point you're trying to strive to say is, it's really important to open up the eyes of communication Mm -hmm. between people to go not just the surface, but to go beyond it to a a deeper level. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So you better understand what the person is. Right. And so that's what I kind of got out of it. Okay. 
What did you get out of the part about emotional intelligence? Well, emotional intelligence is one of those things that are just kind of hard to hard to determine. But emotional intelligence has been a hot button in the last few years mm -hmm. as far as how they can relate emotionally to other people. Okay. Um, when you're playing a game, there's three things that can happen. You could lose, you could draw, or you can win. Do your emotions stay the same regardless of which outcome? No. Is that good or bad? That's good. Why? Because the fact that that way you're gearing your emotions to the situation. <sighs> you're gearing your emotions to the situation. Uh-huh. Have you ever uh, ran across a person, I talked to a person who was real good at basketball. And I said, what, what motivates you? You know what he told me? What? He said, I don't like to lose. I said, what happens when you do lose? You know what he told me? What did he say? He said, I get mad. <laughs> I said, well, why do you get mad? He said, because I lost. I said, don't you understand? If you're going to play the game, there's three things that can happen. You could lose, you could, you could, you could uh, break even or, or draw, or you could win. So if you know there's three components to that game, and you can't tolerate one of them, then why play the game? That's right. I'm going to tell you about me. Whether I win, lose, or draw, I have a poker face. You will never know what my emotions are. My emotions are steady, regardless of which one occurs. That's called control. If you are in total control of your emotions, then you are in total control of your life. It goes back to 10% of what happens to you based on 90% of your reaction to what you do. So I'm always in control. I determine what my reaction is. I can't control that 10% that happens to me, but I can control my reaction. And I sit and I think about what, whatever I'm thinking about, and I work my way through it. I go through a process, and that process serves me well every time. I may not come out with a perfect answer or come out with an answer, but that process gives me a problem, a, a problem solving a methodology, whether I'm getting an MBA or whether I'm getting a PhD. That's basically what you're doing. You're learning to think in a certain process, uh, logical. I'm gonna put it to you like this. I think passion is overrated. You know what's more important than passion? What's more important than passion? Logic and discipline. That's more important than passion. Because I'm gonna tell you something. There are three skill sets that you need in this life to be successful. Soft skills, for example, leadership, management, mm -hmm. project management, communication skills, math skills, writing skills, reading, all those are soft skills. Hard skills, such as uh, Pascal, Fortran, Cobalt, uh, CCC+, uh, Visual, uh, 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 Microsoft Office Suite, uh, whatever, databases and all that, that's, that's hard skill. Those are hard skills. And I'm going to tell you the one. Now, you can get a job with those two skills. You can get a job. You can start a, a career. But I tell you what, those two skills, hard, soft, soft skills and, and, and hard skills, will not sustain you in that job. You will not keep that job. You know what skill you need and that most people are devoid of and is missing? It's called emotional stability, the skill of emotional stability. That is the glue, the linchpin that holds everything together. If you don't have that skill, you will not hold your present or current position for any significant amount of time. 
And how do you, how do you get the skill of emotional stability? Go to the library, go to Books A Million, go to Barnes and Nobles, go to Amazon, and get a copy of that book, Emotional Intelligence 2.0. Then you will be there. Mm. That's my advice to you or anybody else who wants to become 100% employable for life. Now, you know, I mean, there are three theories of management. Theory X, Theory Y, and Theory Z. Are you familiar with those, Andy? Yes, I am. What is Theory Z, a uh, Theory X? Theory X is the autocratic. What does that mean, autocratic? What does that mean in English and down-to-earth language? What does that mean? That means you do as I say. Okay, I, I agree with that. I'm going to put it to you like this. Most low-level managers have a, have a Theory X management style, which means that they don't believe that people want to be on the job, they don't want to be there, that they got to crack the whip, that their people are going to drag their feet, they're going to, they're going to linger, right. whatever. Right. Right. I don't agree with that, personally. Right. I hate it. I hate that. Then there's Theory Y. What is Theory Y? Theory Y is more of a laissez-faire type of theory. What does laissez-faire mean in English? In everyday language, what does that mean? More of an easy going. I'm going I'm to I'm help you with that. I'm going to help you there. Know what it means? It means that you as a manager believe that people are there and want to be there on the job. And they want to do a good job. And they're not trying to cheat you. They're not trying to steal from you. Right. You, you look at people in a positive light that they, 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 they you value these people. Right. You try to empower them. You try to make them more aware. That's theory Y. Right. What is theory Z? The team approach. Team approach? What does that mean? It means everyone operates as a team rather than as individuals. What does that mean? I don't understand. I'm, I'm confused. That means nothing to me. I'm going to help you there again. Know what Theory Z is? You know who invented Theory Z? The Japanese. Right. And you know why they invented Theory Z? Theory Z guarantees their employees lifetime employment. The bottom line is the key word is stability. If I know that I can stay with a company for 30, 40 years or two years, I have that long I want. Mm -hmm. Then I'm stable. I can make plans. I can do things. I can grow. I can achieve. I'm for Theory Z. Know why I'm for Theory Z? Because in my company, right now I'm an associates, I'm the person that's responsible for business development and sales. And I'll tell you right now, there's nobody in the world who's better at business development and sales than me. No, I don't care who it is. I'm special forces. Even the special forces, the best of the best, can touch me. And I, and I can get into that too, but I'm not going to get. But what I'm going to tell you is, what I'm going to tell you is, my job as as upper management is to keep the contracts and the work in the pipeline so that the worker will not be laid off, be fired, or the plant. Or the, or, the, or the business will go close their doors. That's my job as management. If I don't do my job, what happens to the worker? Then get done. So I got to do my job. My job is business development and sales. So if I'm not the best in the world, how can I guarantee a broker 100% lifetime employment if they want it? It's their choice, it's their decision. But if they want it, it's there. And I can do that because I'm the best at doing that. There's nobody better than me. That's called competent strategic thinking. Competent strategic thinking starts from a level of incompetency to a level which rises to a level of competency. Starts from a level of beginner or novice to a level of become expert. That's what I do. And I do it fast, I can do it as fast, as slow, uh, as whatever I want. Now I'm going to tell you something about team building. 
Who's the world foremost authority on team building? I don't know. A guy by the name of Robert Tuckman. Dr. Robert Tuckman. Have you ever heard of him? Nope. He has a BA degree in psychology. He has a master's degree in psychology. And he has a PhD in, in degree in psychology. Back in the 1960s, he came up with four stages of team building. Four in the 1960s. He called them forming, norming, no, forming, storming, norming, and performing. Do you get that? So first of all, you got to form a team. You get everybody, all different personalities, they got different aims or whatever. And then you get to what we call storming. You got people that got personality differences, you got idiosyncrasies, you got ticks, you got people slamming doors, jumping on top of tables, cussing each other out or whatever. Okay, you get through that period, then you go to what we call norming. Uh, they understand each other, they know what their hot buttons are, they know how to talk to each other, they know how to get things done. And then you go from norming, you go to performing. Performing is everybody's operating on eight cylinders. Before you finish a sentence, I know, I know, the, I, I know the last words of that sentence. I can finish it for you. That's how good you are. He, he figured that out in the 1960s. And then in 1975, he came back with the last one called adjourning. Know what that means? It's like anything else. You got alpha, you got omega. You got the beginning, you got the end. Any, any team has a beginning and has an end. That's the life cycle. So at some point, the team is going to break up for whatever reason. Mm -hmm. The mission has been accomplished, or somebody dies, or somebody gets married, or somebody moves off, whatever reason. The team is going to break up. You know what happens when the team breaks up? What happens? What normally happens when, somebody, when you have a breakup in a relationship? What happens? What, what feelings or emotions do you go through? Very negative emotions. You feel a sense of loss, a sense, a sense of, a sense of death, a sense of, uh, uh, a sorrow. I mean, you, you, it's kind of like somebody dying in your family, like you're, you know, somebody real close to you. You're grieving. You're, you're in a period of grieving, a grievance. You go through all these emotions, but that's part of the team building. So what I understand is, I'm gonna tell you what Robert, uh, what Robert Tubman says. He says there is no way to short circuit that process. You got to go through it. I'm going to tell you, I'm a big person, uh, a fan of theory and experience. I build a model, and I build a theory, and that theory does one or two things. Well, that theory should, if it's a good theory, it's going to do three things. This is from my STEM background, my science, technology, engineering, mathematics background. That's, that, that model is going to do three things. It's going to allow me to look back in the past and to explain the past. It's going to allow me to look at the present and explain the present. And, the, and this is the key. That model, if it's a good model, is going to allow me to look into the future and predict the future accurately. Then you got a good model. And that's what I do.